Hello and welcome to College Theater Auditions presented by Playbill and The Growing Studio. I'm Danny George. Every Friday, I sit down with different musical theater and acting colleges from across the country. Every Monday and Wednesday, I sit down with different directors, choreographers, music directors, composers, and more. For all of the latest up-to-date information uh, on our streams, check us out on Instagram. It's at Playbill and at The Growing Studio. I am so excited to welcome two wonderful universities today, Temple and Penn State. Are you there? Hi Hello. there. How's Hi, it, Danny. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Excited uh, to doing? be here. Good. Where are you currently quarantining? I am um, in my apartment in the heart of Philadelphia. Great to see you, Danny. I am just outside of State College, actually in a little town called Port Matilda. Oh, wow. How, that's fantastic. I'm glad you guys are close to your schools. Are you starting up uh, very soon, huh? Yes, we start classes August 24th, so we've got a week. And same, same for us. Yeah, August 24th, the, wow. the, uh, the adventure begins. <laughs> well, we have so many questions about how classes will operate. I can't wait to, to start that discussion. Uh, if any of our viewers have any questions, please comment on Facebook or YouTube. We'll be bringing a couple of people onto the broadcast today to ask Maggie and John for yourselves. Uh, so let's get started. John, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Penn State and a little bit about the program? Sure, of course. We are um, we are a BFA in musical theater that is housed in the School of Theater, which is housed in the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State. So that's a mouthful. But we're a BFA musical theater degree. Uh, we're a four-year undergraduate program, and um, we sit alongside other programs in the school, the BFA in acting, uh, every design category and stage management and uh, technical production as well. So we're a fully functioning School of Theater, and we're the musical theater arm. Thank you. Maggie, same question. Yeah, we are a BFA program within the larger uh, theater department, which is one of the larger center for performing and cinematic arts. Um, we are a conservatory style training program within a liberal arts environment and container. So we have a specialized area of focus, but also um, options to really broaden their worldview. Um, Temple is a true college campus in the middle of a major metropolitan city um, that's really rich in historical and cultural offerings. Um, it's full of diversity and it's a, it's a great spot to come and train. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about next week? Uh, let, let's talk about the precautions that you guys are taking. How will you uh, offer uh, classes uh, and what that looks like for musical theater uh, majors? You'll pardon. You'll pardon my bloodshot eyes. I bet Maggie shares this. We've been <laughs> we've been working since March twelfth at trying to answer mm -hmm. some of these questions. You know, the the minute that we uh, could figure out that that fall. 2020 was not going to be quote unquote normal in the way we deliver the classes. So at Penn State, uh, we're not, I, I think, uh, different from a lot of schools. We've got different delivery mechanisms for the classes. So in musical theater, uh, we've decided that we don't believe singing can safely happen in rooms with each other. Mm -hmm. And so we've moved our voice lessons to Zoom and we've moved our classes that are heavily singer based to Zoom. Some of the acting classes, we're gonna give it a go. We've got some hybrid scenarios where half the class will be in the room and half will be on Zoom and then they will alternate the next day just so that we can follow the appropriate mask and social distancing per room. So Penn State has gone through and done COVID room capacities to make sure that, that those students are safe. And we've got a variety of masks that have been either purchased or my favorite is one that's designed by a colleague uh, of ours, Charlene Gross in our costume uh, costume program and it looks sort of like a beekeeper but it covers everything <laughs> and it's you know anti uh, anti fog and you can sort of hear yourself and we we think we can start some acting classes that way you know all of this is a great big experiment and we'll we'll find out together and we'll we will i think make great decisions on the fly as to what we need to do for the safety and security of our students but more than you know just as important as that uh, we think we can deliver this curriculum in this in this way it's not going to be the the what everybody's used to but we think we can have a meaningful semester together 
Now, John, there's two things I know to be true about Penn State after visiting the school uh, for a couple of years. One is that you guys have the best ice cream in the entire world. Uh, and the second thing is that you have phenomenal dancers. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how dance classes will function? Absolutely. So we have, uh, we are, we're lucky to have a, a gigantic dance studio where a lot of our classes are happening. And so we've, again, decided to, we've decided to convene those classes either in full or in part, depending on the capacity of the class and uh, and put a bunch of precautions in place. So can we stand close together and learn combinations? No. Uh, can we work on technique? Can we work on stretching? Can we work on things where in-person education is necessary for dance technique to move ahead? Yes, we can. And so we'll figure out how to do part of that in the room, part of that on Zoom. And frankly, what I've been telling all of our students is whatever whatever we fall short on this semester, we'll come back and pick it up before you leave. We will make, we will, you know, you, we'll just keep lists together. We have some unfinished business with the class of 2020 as a perfect example of that. Right. Uh, and we'll, we'll hold true to our, to our bargain the minute the world lets us. Thank you. As for the ice cream, it's open and uh, no, no problems there. Social distancing, but no problems there. <laughs> Thank you. Matt, I can talk about some precautions that Temple is taking. Yeah, we have a very similar case scenario um, in terms of the preparation that the university has taken um, with each coding each space for capacity. Um, so we're doing a mixture of virtual online learning, hybrid classes, and some in-person limited capacity, of course, and following safety precautions, mask wearing um, in all buildings, following social distancing, et cetera. So, you know, we've really, since March as well, had to do some divergent thinking about pedagogy and come up with creative solutions to problems um, and continue to try to find meaningful education and training under a different forum and format. So um, as educators, we've really been looking at, you know, not only the safety precautions in order to code certain things, we're the same in the same um, boat in terms of singing live, no live singing, that will all be done um, online. Uh, dance classes are going to be taught virtually, but there are spaces available for the students to use if they need them. And then we do a walkthrough. So all content is modified, you know, for a smaller space. So it's going deeper. It's focusing on different learning goals um, in the way that we have to shift and modify. And we're hoping, you know, that the students really look at look at this as um you know, using your artistry to come up with creative ways to solve problems and to go deeper and to look at different aspects of the training than we may, you know, than we may do in a traditional in-person setting. Mm -hmm. So acting classes are some hybrid form, um, you know, certain student groups meet on certain days working with the professor. So it's a real um, mixed bag of what uh, training is going to look like. Our productions will be live streamed. Um, but I think, you know, the, the silver lining too is even with editing and, you know, an increased digital literacy, students learn to sort of look at the work from a broader perspective, you know, um, so that they're thinking as not just actors, but they're also looking at the directorial vision, um, the dramaturgical vision of things when you have to sort of edit and do things online as well. Thank you. Danny, can I just add one tiny thing there too? Because I, I think it's been so interesting. I'm sure you found this too, Maggie. What what the requirements or the limitations of Zoom have allowed in terms of the way we can think about delivering curriculum. I think about when we were forced onto Zoom in the spring, we had a chance to put our, our seniors through a couple of big units of self-tape. You know, how how and why and and how best to create self-tapes, which is something that hadn't been as meaningful a part of our curriculum as it now will be based mm -hmm. on the success of, of what uh, COVID-19 sort of made us do. Um, this fall, we would, there's a, a class who basically not meeting in person has ripped the class out from under us. And so we've got five writing teams that are gonna join us via Zoom and we're gonna create labs for our seniors to work on new pieces, try wow. to try to teach them how to engage as an actor in a brand new piece and also meet all of these people who are without work in New York, these incredible writers who don't have work. And so we're gonna pay them to be a part of our lab 
for the fall. And I can't wait to do that with our students. Um, and lastly, just about productions are, we've decided as a school of theater to go completely online with productions. Um, and what we've decided as, uh, as an opportunity uh, to that decision is that we've thrown out everything that we had planned on because they don't really work online and uh, decided to focus all of our performance production opportunities online this fall on areas that represent our commitment to racial justice. And mm -hmm. so it gives us an opportunity to actually engage in these conversations that have been so important in a meaningful way inside the work that we're doing as artists because we've uh, because we have this uh, opportunity to do so. So we're thrilled about some of the positives here too. That's fantastic. Oh, sorry, Maggie, go ahead. Oh, no, I, yeah, I think that's that's so beautiful, John, and, and imperative, I think, for our students that this does provide another level of accessibility um, to the industry artists that is highly beneficial. Um, mm -hmm as well as you know the digital literacy of self-taping and those promotional materials as the industry shifts and changes that's going to be another imperative tool for our students to develop and to have thank you um john you mentioned uh some racial uh, justices if we can talk a little bit about what penn state is doing to promote diversity in your program uh, to make sure all students are treated uh equitably and fairly certainly um we're really excited to be a part of these conversations that are happening nationwide. And, uh, and I guess personally, I feel like this generation of young people has an opportunity to go out and be the change that our generations couldn't be or weren't able to be. Uh, and so uh, how exciting for us to participate in their activism and in their ability to be the leaders that they wanna be. Mm -hmm. So at Penn State Musical Theater sits inside the School of Theater. And so there've been a couple of key things already that have happened in the school. One of which is we've uh, appointed an associate director of the school specifically for equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and we're undergoing as faculty and staff, uh, tra diversity training for all faculty and staff uh, in the fall that will not just be a one and done, but will continue as a meaningful part of faculty and staff development. In musical theater, uh, we've begun some things that can happen right away and some things that are gonna take some longer term structural conversations um, to be able to, to recognize the right decisions. I would say the, um, the things right away, we're doing a, a kind of a course by course analysis and evaluation of our, of our curriculum, and that'll be ongoing throughout the year. Um, we've been having some summer weekly conversations with our students of color to help identify the steps inside musical theater that we can take together as a reflection of their experience uh, inside our program. And one of the things that has come out of these conversations already is something we can, we can change immediately, which is, um, you know, we've always unintentionally, I think, or maybe intentionally kind of considered in dance, as you mentioned earlier, Danny, that ballet sort of, it all kind of re returns and be begins and returns to ballet. And, uh, and we've decided to switch the beginning of our students' journey. And so now everybody starts with introduction to African dance. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's taught by one of our incredible um, BIPOC faculty members. And so it's just one of a lot of ways that I think we are trying to decentralize that Eurocentric um, dance environment and frankly, musical theater environment. Um, I could go on and on. We're, we're trying to be a little bit more intentional and front facing with our Instagram. Right now we've started, uh, our students are captaining a project that we're calling Black Saturdays. And so we're putting content every Saturday that that is even if it's just for our own community at, at Penn State, uh, but if anybody else would like it, it's it's there. It's speakers and takeovers and book and film lists and things that we can do to continue our own education, all of us together. Um, it, it, that's just a, a small list of some of the things that we're engaged in, but we're, like I think a lot of people, completely uh, committed, excited, and energized about these conversations. Thank you, John. Sure. Yeah, at, at Temple um, as well, we are committed and excited to this opportunity for the evolution of our humanity, and we are committed to the work of anti-racism, social justice practices. Um, we have a mission statement in our program called Cultivating the Citizen Artist. Um, so we do um, believe in the use of artistic expression as a tool for 
creating and sustaining sort of a culture of compassionate citizenship. So mm -hmm. with that said, um, the Center for the Performing and Cinematic Arts also established um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Uh, we have one for the university at large, but we established one particularly for the arts um, for that focus. Uh, in which department representatives, faculty, students, alumni, staff will serve. And we will be taking a lot of cues regarding social justice from this kind of governing body. Um, some of the action steps that we're taking um, in support of the mission statements that we've put out on various levels are establishing regular forums, student faculty staff meetings surrounding um, racial equity in the department and in the arts. Um, we're expanding our student component of like our season advisory, how we pick mm -hmm. productions and what the canon looks like that we are producing. Um, we work also with uh, the university, the Temple Institution for Diversity, Equity, Advocacy and Leadership, which is a university organization. And they are implementing anti-racism training for faculty, students, staff. We're looking at implicit bias in the classroom as well as trauma-informed pedagogy. And these workshops have been ongoing for faculty all summer and will continue um, regularly now just as an instituted part of what we do as a department. Um, some other actions are really, as John mentioned, we're really revisiting and revising what our curriculum looks like, <laughs> um, what our definition of the theatrical canon is, um, to recommend more sort of equitable um, reflection of BIPOC artists. Mm -hmm. We are creating and fostering um, relationships with BIPOC arts organizations in the community to sort of foster more networking opportunities um, for BIPOC students and alumni specifically. And we are in the process of developing um, some accessible web-based resources with links to theatrical works by BIPOC artists as well as other BIPOC related topics in theater as well as prioritizing um, the recruitment and hiring of more black faculty and increasing black student enrollment. So we're really um, we're really excited about the diversity of the incoming class and you know the primary goal is to really uplift and empower the voice of future artists and kind of redefine what the American theater canon um, will look like so that more people are represented from, from all walks of life. Maggie, John, thank you so much for your commitment to it. We It is, it is uh, so appreciated. Uh, I have a simple question about logistics. How many students do you take uh, per year? Uh, for us at Penn State, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be a set number. We I, I would say 12 is what we're sort of aiming for. But if that ends up being 11 or 13, then so be it. You know, we're shooting for 12. We currently have 49 students in the program. So that would be um, uh, around 50 is where we, we'd like to be for the four-year cohort. Thanks. Uh, we tend to have classes from about 16 to 20 on average. That's kind of our, our goal for a BFA musical theater class. Thank you so much. Now I have a couple of viewers who want to come on if that's okay. That's great. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Very good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Glad you guys are here. We have two alumni uh, from Penn State. We have Christian and Lexi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience at Penn State and why you chose that program? Let's start with Christian. Oh, sure. I was going to say Lexi can go first, but that's all right. Um, I, um, yeah, sure. That's a, a big question. Uh, so I graduated in 2015. Um, my reason for going to Penn State at first uh, was because I was a walk-in actually at Unifieds, which I guess isn't really happening right now. Um, but I was a walk-in for Unified and then went home and did my research and realized it was this great program, uh, not too far away from New York City, but far enough away that I didn't feel the need to audition all the time. I think that's the other thing that's great. You can go and see shows and things like that, uh, but you can really focus on the work and that's what we did there. Um, my experience at Penn State was, was great, uh, you know, ups and downs like any college will have. 
Uh, I had a great time and I learned so much from some amazing professors, uh, including uh, Cora Franklin and Steve Brodnax. Um, Mary Saunders Barton uh, was my vocal coach there. Uh, Susan H. Shulman was there. Uh, she was also one of my professors. Uh, so just, I mean, brilliant minds that really helped. And I, I met some of my lifelong friends and, and soon to be uh, bosses like Dominique Moriso, who, who wrote Ain't Too Proud, which is, you know, the Broadway show I am waiting to go back to. Um, so, but I, I met her right on the Penn State campus. So um, it was, it was a great time uh, and definitely very, very valuable for me in starting my career. Lexi? Global <laughs> Princeton International Actress Lexi Rhodes. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I was actually, I didn't know that I was going to go to school for musical theater, but um, I was introduced to this voice teacher and he told me the top programs in the country at the time. And I auditioned for seven and I got into Penn State. <laughs> <laughs> and it was incredible. It was it was so meant to be. It was totally meant to be. Um, and I had an incredible experience there. Um, like Christian said, ups and downs, but I got all of the tools that I needed to survive in this industry. Um, and I know that the program has come a long way since I've been there. Um, I was the first uh, class to graduate with the musical theater degree. So I graduated in 2009. Wow. Yeah, everybody before us was um, a theater degree with a musical theater em emphasis. So yeah, it's been it's been incredible though. I'm very grateful for Penn State. <laughs> now you both had such exciting careers. Lexi, can you talk a little bit about how Penn State prepared you uh, for all the shows and all the work you've done? Yeah, so I mean, the the showcase, first of all, um, was incredible, uh, just to be put on display for all of the industry. And we also had, I'm not sure if Penn State still does this, but the Musical Theater Spotlight. Um, John, do you do that still? We just we just call it something different now. We call it Places, okay. but it's the, the spirit is still the same. It's for your websites and digital content. Fantastic, exactly. Um, so that gave me all of the footage that I needed as well to get my face out there. Um, I've originated four off-Broadway shows. I have recently in the past few years gotten into the cruise industry, which has led me to guest entertainment. And I travel the world now with my own show called Lexi Roads in Concert. So <laughs> it's been great. And, and I, I have to say it because we all fell in love with you on the Grease show. Oh yeah, <laughs> back in 2000. <laughs> Seven. That's right. I was actually a sophomore in college then. I was in the top 12 female finalists for Grease, You're the One That I Want. And that was really awesome. I was like 19 You're years so old and like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Same question. How has Penn State prepared you for your career? Oh, man. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I learned at Penn State was uh, how to assist in creating shows. Uh, I was fortunate enough to create uh, a show with Dominique uh, called Blood at the Root. It was myself and five grad actors. Uh, and we traveled the world with it. We went to South Africa twice. We went to Scotland and Australia. Uh, we toured all the Penn State branch campuses. Uh, so that was the big thing because then I was fortunate enough, uh, my first job outside of college was after midnight on Norwegian Cruise Line. Um, and, you know, so getting to work with uh, Warren Carlisle and Jason Sparks, who was a PSU alum as well, um, on that and, and figuring out how that would work on a cruise ship. Uh, I did that, then I got off the ship and I joined the 20th anniversary tour of Rent, where I played Benny and understudied Roger, um, which once again was, was very much a collaborative effort. Uh, myself and the choreographer, uh, Marlise Yearby, uh, kind of re-envisioned what the Benny track would look like uh, mm -hmm. to better suit my, my hip hop background. Um, and then I joined Ain't Too Proud, the world premiere uh, at Berkeley Rep, uh, which then three years later, you know, is now a, you know, Tony Award winning for best choreography show, uh, you know, on Broadway uh, and was, was chugging along and doing really well uh, until COVID hit, but we are excited to come back as soon as possible. So for me, Penn State was a place of, of collaboration and learning uh, what that looks like in, in multi, you know, multifaceted places, whether that be a cruise ship or a Broadway show. 
Thank you so much, Christian. I saw you too proud. Brilliant, Lexi. I've worked with you before. You know, I think you are at the bee's knees. Uh, I just so, I so appreciate you guys both jumping on to talk about your school. It means a lot. Um, thank you so much. I hope to see you in a show very soon. Danny, there's very only soon. there's only there's only one negative to this, and it's that I did not get the great pleasure of being at Penn State with either Lexi or Christian. But I'm but I'm right. so I have no reason to be proud as a human of your education, but I am. And I'm so grateful that you uh, came on today. And I I follow your careers with with excitement. Uh, A too proud Christian was incredible. I mean, forget it. Thank you. Okay, enough. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So, in turn, I have someone from Temple who I'd like to bring on, if that's all right. That's great. Hi, Jordan. What's up? <laughs> How's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Where are you quarantining? Uh, in Philly. Oh, good. Not too far. Not far at all. I'm with my family, which has been pretty nice. Jordan, can you talk a little bit about your experience at Temple University? Yes. Well, first off, hi, Maggie. I miss you. Hi, Jordan. <laughs> I miss you, too. It's so wonderful to see you. Thank you for being here. Of course. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed my time at Temple. Um, <clears throat> Basically, yeah, I, I decided to do musical theater uh, pretty late in the game. Uh, I was an instrumental musician and I was gonna go to school for that. And then I saw a show in Philly and there was a Temple student in it, Catherine Bruner. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to Temple. Like this is, it. <laughs> it was a quick decision for me and I auditioned. It was a wonderful experience. Maggie was in the room along with um, other mentors that I've had at Temple. and. Uh, yeah, I, I can only say I had great things, um, great experiences, and I got to work outside of school a lot, which was really awesome and like a second education for me while I was still a student. And Jordan, can you talk a little bit about how Temple prepared you to play Tony in West Side Story? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, first off, like the vocal training alone, like I could not have sang this this uh, this music my freshman year at all. <laughs> um, and then on top of it, um, the dancing, like Tony is not much of a dancer, but in this production, everyone is moving and everyone is so physical. And I was not a dancer at Temple and it was really Maggie that um, saw that in me and like <laughs> helped me train my butt off for four <laughs> years. <laughs> and understand like what I already have to offer and not to fit into any mold, but like to be myself and to, uh, figure out a way to allow that to come through in my artistry. So that was huge for me. That's awesome. And can you talk a little bit about campus life uh, at Temple? Yes, okay. I loved Temple um, so much for this reason because we're in a city, we're in North Philly. Um, mm -hmm. So campus life was super exciting. You know, um, there's always something to do. You can just pop on the train and like go to Center City and see any show that you want. If you're a theater major, you have to. So there's so much theater in the city and so much art, you can go to dance shows, or I even used to just like do my homework on the art museum steps, cause I thought it was beautiful. Um, so yeah, things like that. I'm going to school in Philadelphia, specifically Temple was uh, just beautiful and always exciting. Awesome, Jordan, thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate it. It means so much to have you come back and talk about your program, it, it really does. Of course, the program means a lot to me. So thanks for having me. Of course, stay safe, stay healthy. I hope to see you on stage soon. I'm sure Maggie wants to say something. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jordan. You're just such the epitome of a wonderful, risk-taking, um, empowered artist. And we're just so thrilled um, with everything that uh, you're participating in and the way that you're expressing yourself in the world. So thank you. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about your dance programs. You know, I loved what Jordan said about becoming a dancer at Temple. I think that's fantastic. You know, there's so many uh, prospective students that I think fear the dance call um, that don't have a lot of dance experience. And in turn, there's so many with so much dance experience that we find some programs are, you know, it's, it's a mix of both. If you could talk about dance at your school, that would be great. I'd love to start with you, Maggie. Sure. Um... 
So I like to think of sort of dance and movement as embodiment practices. And that is what we're cultivating in the artist. Mm. Um, and so that they're, they're exposed to uh, diverse methodologies of embodiment, um, diverse cultures of embodiment, so that they're really able to kind of be empathy warriors in their bodies <laughs> um, mm. as well. So dance training, of course, I'm sure in lots of programs across the board, there's a huge disparity of um, just experience in terms of the training or skills. Um, but we don't want to let that deter anyone um, because we try to really create an environment for taking risks, for seeing potential um, in terms of, of dance and the dance call. We also try to really cultivate an environment where people can feel nurtured and yet challenged and not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that from, from the initial dance call and what, what kind of we require out of a pre-screen so that people really have agency over the way they wanna express themselves mm -hmm. in terms of dance. Um, with the program itself, um, we train in sort of all styles in terms of the roots and branches of jazz dance. Um, I love what you were saying earlier, John, about starting with African dance. Um, it's really important that the students understand the ancestral lineage of different dance forms and can both experience a diversified curriculum and also find themselves within that curriculum in terms of representation with dance. That is huge and something that I personally am working as an ongoing process to um, continue my commitment to. Mm -hmm. So they train in jazz, ballet, um, hip hop, tap, there's also electives in Pilates, yoga, Alexander Technique, Lecoq, stage combat, different types of embodiment um, uh, for them to, to experience what it means to be a, a mover, right, or a dancer. And everybody is really um, challenged to go past their notions of limitations, you know, and the way that they self-identify. I'm a singer actor, I don't dance, you know, and I'm like, well, let's explore that. Let's <laughs> explore that. Um, and I think, you know, students, with a will and a desire are really pleasantly surprised as to how much they can transform in this area. Um, you know, with musical theater, the ability to express through text and acting, through song, and express a character's inner narrative or external circumstances through dance um, is, is really crucial. They don't all have to operate on the same level of ability, but right. a student needs to have, you know, a definite proficiency in those areas, you know, in order to really um, thrive, I think, in the career path of musical theater. So we train in all those areas all four years. There's also theater dance techniques and style, looking at the repertoire, looking at different choreographers, um, and then what is the students with creative projects and creative work, what's the student's own impetus for creative and self-expression through the modality of dance. Thank you. John, same question. I love that, Maggie. That sounds like a great a great comprehensive place that I would uh, that I wish I would have had when I was younger. <laughs> um, I, I would say at Penn State we we value dance incredibly. Um, we value it just like we value singing and acting, and most importantly, how all of those three things collide with each other and in, intersect each other, and kind of all feel like they are part of 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 having an impulse that is designed to tell a story, uh, solve a dilemma in a circumstance, you know, there, it all kind of relates to us. And so it, in the same way that if you looked at our course, um, our course catalog, you would absolutely see if you were a dancer in high school and you were wanting to make sure that your, uh, that your college program had enough dance for you to continue improving, we are absolutely the place for you. If you've uh, only have dance at Miss Tilly's Dance Barn under Highway 3 in your town, uh, we're still the place for you because we level each of our classes. We have a beginner, usually an intermediate, and then an advanced section of each of the classes, and your journey belongs to you. So the way you kind of maneuver through the actual technical requirements of that is uh, is up to you. And if you're a dancer who's come through all kinds of incredible pre-college programs uh, will stick you in those levels and make sure that you are continuing to progress. Um, in terms of philosophy, I think there's this great thing about the, the way that our faculty work. We encourage our students not to look sideways in their journey. We want their journey to be theirs. And so there is nowhere where that's more evident than the dance classroom because of that variety of experience. And so um, not only are we helping them into 
perhaps the correct section based on their technical ability, but we're also trying to push and nudge them, not necessarily them and the person next to them and the person next to them and the person next to them. So uh, that sort of permeates all that, that we think about and all that we talk about. And, and dance appears not only in things that have a prefix that says dance, it appears in all of our studio classes, it appears in in ways that you would never know that it's embedded into our curriculum. And then for the things that say dance, whatever course number, um, we train in you know African and ballet and tap and jazz and styles. There's a great year long sequence in the third year uh, that is designed to introduce the students to a myriad of choreographers um, so that hopefully everybody finds themselves reflected back at them from their uh, from their own experience and their own backgrounds. And then in their upper class years, that's the sort of prescribed journey. Mm -hmm. In their upper class years, they have a lot of agency as to what they want to take. If they want to uh, study, we have an incredible Alexander teacher, Gwen Walker, who's also one of our, on our voice faculty is tremendous. And, and so students can choose to study with her. They can take uh, hip hop, they can take ballroom, they can take um, uh, uh, a kind of a, I guess the best way, like Broadway dance has a menu of classes you could choose from. Our upper class years sort of have a menu for our for our students to choose from. And there's curated advisement. And we always want to have a little voice in their heads as they're making their own decisions. But the but the decisions belong to them. And, and we, I think the best compliment we could ever get is that the non-dancer felt great as they were moving through the program. And the dancer dancer felt supported and also great as they were moving through the program. Thank you. This question relates to dance. It's from YouTube. It's from a username, DEF. Uh, what is your plan for any partnering for dance classes? Well, we won't be partnering um, <laughs> this fall 2020. Um, we will be partnering on an energetic level <laughs> and on a virtual level. And we will be partnering on an emotional level. <laughs> Well, we won't actually be physically touching each other um, until we get clearance and that is safe to, to go back to. So we will practice those other ways um, of being in partnership. <laughs> I imagine you have the same answer, is that right? I'm in love with that answer, man. That's <laughs> terrific. Yes, um, it's so hard to say to somebody asking a question, uh, no. But it, but it's true. We're not. It's just not safe enough for us to partner right now. We'll come back and pick it up when it's safe. Awesome. I have three questions. We're going to do rapid fire answers because they're purely logistical. Uh, what type of GPA do we need to get into Temple and to need to get into Penn State? With Temple, they take into account um, a lot of different factors um, mm -hmm. in terms of your test scoring or if you opt out and you want to do the writing portion for that, as well as your GPA, as well as extracurricular activities, et cetera. So they're really looking holistically at your application. Um, you can see if you go to the Temple University website, there's a quick fact sheet that's really transparent and outlines kind of these, these questions. So I, it's, it's not a set GPA that's a must <laughs> for a yes or no, but they're looking at the big picture of different things. Same for Penn State, I, I would say. I, it's one of my favorite things in the world is that I don't know the answer to that question because I don't think there is a real easy answer to that. So at Penn State, we have an artistic evaluation that is in our hands at the musical theater level. And then there's an academic portfolio evaluation that's going on through the admissions office. At the end of that process, we indicate the folks that we would like to offer admission to and admissions, if there's any reason that we should have a further discussion about that person, we can have it at that time. But it's not it's not specific to GPA or test scores or extracurriculars or, or, or it's kind of a, a holistic thing there. And we're, they're also recognizing that, that people are heading into a very curated pre-professional training program as well. So there's all of that in, is taken into consideration. Thank you. Uh, this is a mixed questions from two people. Uh, this is from YouTube from a username Eve Jersinski. Uh, and a question all the way from Brazil from Eduarda Viana Regis, who is a rising high school senior. Uh, how will auditions work uh, this year? And what are you looking for in these updated auditions? Uh, w we are. Um... I know that the the unified auditions, which we're a member of, are all going to be online. That that's been just recently announced. Um, we have auditions 
that in a, in a typical year, we would have auditions a little bit in December before the holiday break. And then we'd pick them up in earnest in January and February. Um, we've already decided that our December date uh, has to be virtual because Penn State, regardless of how well it goes in the fall, we'll, we will have jumped to virtual past Thanksgiving. So we'll have to, we'll have to conduct that one virtually. We haven't made any determination yet about the January, February, March dates because we want to, we don't want to get out in front of any knowledge that we'll get from our governor, our president, et cetera, about safety. So we're kind of TBAing those, but we should know by the time the pre-screen decisions come out, we should know the answers to those questions. So I would say part B of that was, I think, how to, how to best get to know them? Was that yeah? No, how 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 to best present yourself? In, in, in yeah, I mean, you know, virtually, it's we're all going to be under a learning curve this year, and we're all going to be in the same world. So I've had a lot of a lot of high school uh, rising seniors say things like, "How will you get to know me if we're not in the same room?" And the answer is, we'll figure that out all together. You know, it'll likely be a, le- a slightly longer process of of, uh, I hesitate to call it an interview, but some some longer exchange where a human can talk to a human and make sure, because we want, we want just as much as we wanna make good decisions, we want students to make good decisions once they have their options in front of them. So we will figure it out um, if, if, it, if and when it has to be virtual all year, we'll figure that out. And I, that's the best I can say is, uh, I, wish, I wish that college applicants would remove that level of stress from from an already stressful kind of year for them. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Holly Fong uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, she is a rising high school senior. Roughly how many international students are accepted into your program each year? Um, this shifts from year to year, depending on who is in our audition pool. Mm -hmm. But uh, we consider people from all over. We actually have quite a lot of international students that participate in our MA in Musical Theater Studies program. Um, So we're always looking and we will take video submissions. Like you don't have to do an on-campus audition if you are an international student looking um, to come unless you want to come to campus. Uh, So we just sort of look towards look towards the talent pool and we're happy to get people from from all over the world. Same for Penn State. We want to we want to cast as as we want we want to sort of a student body that represents the world. And so uh, if when when we are lucky enough to have international students interested in coming to Central Pennsylvania for their training, we look at them in that audition process very very hard and it is not atypical for us to extend offers of admission and then and then have them come and join us. It's it's a wonderful uh, addition to our program for sure. Love it. Love having international students. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, for a graduate student. His name is Colden Lamb and he's from San Diego. I'm applying in the fall for Penn State's MFA in musical theater directing and Temple's MFA in musical theater collaboration with a specialization in directing. Do you have any tips or ways to stand out when applying for these programs in regards to goal statements and the personal interview? Thank you in advance for answering this question. Uh, yes, definitely. For our MFA in direction for the musical stage, I would say the one of the key components is that your materials, such as they are, reflect kind of your point of view. How, what kind of artist? What kind of artist are you at the moment? What are you looking for from your MFA uh, in directing? And what kind of artist do you want to be coming out of that? And and for us, the the more the more we can get excited about somebody who already has a developing point of view on that, but wants to go and and uh, and have deeper training in refining that and becoming an artist with a strong uh, center, then we're excited. I mean, that stands out immediately to us. What we're less likely to be excited about is somebody who is just trying to sort of say, "I want to be a director." Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think that's a tricky that's a tricky application to stand out for us, but I want to be a director because starts to become a really uh, powerful application. Thank you. Maggie. Yeah, I would say the same thing. The, the kind of articulate justification of what your vision is as an artist, uh, point of view, the type of art that you want to put out into the world, um, what creates meaning for you, (laughs) where you find meaning and purpose um, within your art, Uh, particularly for our MFA and collaboration too, um, including some 
sort of ideas about the collaborative process, your thoughts about what collaboration means and looks like in real time with the various facets of theater making, um, and then um, different approaches to the process of what theater making looks like, whether it's devising or more of a tectonic theater project approach, you know, the different ways that we can come together and collaborate and make new work is also important for us to understand what your vision is for that and to be able to articulate that. Thank you. Uh, this question is also from YouTube. It is from a user named Jesse Levin. Can you speak about performance opportunities across all four years? Do students have opportunities to receive equity points while in school? Uh, for for us at Penn State, um, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, we don't we don't actually uh, distribute equity points, but we have terrific relationships with a bunch of theaters. We have theaters come through every year and audition privately at Penn State because they've had great relationships with our students in the past. Uh, we have other theaters that we've got a little block of auditions held for us if our students want to go to those theaters or to New York. And so we're we're thrilled to help our students into rooms that that they can't perhaps get into themselves yet. And so I would say that as those theaters have EMC points available uh, to that extent, we're very, very grateful and, and want to help our students that wanna go that route. Uh, as far as production opportunities, it's our goal. We don't want our first semester, first year students to be in, in production in a cast way. Um, we think it's a little bit, you know, going to college, I, I hate to sound like I'm in this age bracket, but here goes. Um, it's already a huge adjustment to go become a college student. And we don't want to, we don't want to meet you one day and then the very next day say, okay, you ready? Go be in that play before you even know how we'd like you to think about being in that musical or that play. And so we want in that first semester, we want a, a period of acclimation and a period of time where our young students can can arrive at our campus and understand the way that we would like them to think about making theater before we actually sort of send them to the stage. It's our goal after that, that each of the seven remaining semesters in your degree, you would have a meaningful production experience. And hopefully when you look back uh, at the end of that, you can see at least seven experiences that run the gamut of uh, maybe you swing an understudy uh, a couple of roles in this show when you're early in your trajectory. Maybe you play a giant lead in that show. Maybe this is a show where you played in an ensemble cast in a in a space that that show was in the round. Maybe this is a sort of more traditional proscenium space, but a really contemporary rock show. Our goal is to try to curate help curate that experience so that you get out of your experience with us as much as as much and as varied as you possibly can. Mm, thank you. That's great. Uh, we have a full production main stage season that all students um, in any year are allowed to audition for. We produce two musicals, four plays, two operas, as well as many workshop performances. We do a lot of new work because we have the MFA that is constantly creating new work and we bring other teams of artists um, to campus to workshop things. So our students are well versed in um, creating original roles as well as doing the traditional uh, canon from uh, dramatic literature. Um, we also have a student produced organization that is um, funded by the department so that students can experiment with uh, being producers, being designers, directors, actors, writers, et cetera. So there's our main stage season, there's a student run season, and then there's constant opportunity for um, if you wanna be in a film, we are part of the film and media arts school as well. So on camera work, as well as just ongoing workshops and showcases, reviews, cabarets that are happening throughout the year. And many of our students, um, audition outside, we do allow that, um, and audition for a lot of the opportunities that are in theaters in Philadelphia. So a lot of our students, some graduate with their equity card, um, depending on what opportunities they have, but most of them graduate with a professional credit on their resume, um, which, is, which is terrific. Or they are involved with an organization through some internship or apprenticeship where they get that kind of hands-on industry experience, as well as what we can offer um, for performance. 
Thank you. I will say, Jesse, if you are a high school student and you're already thinking about equity points, you are so far ahead of the game. <laughs> really, that's wonderful. Um, also for equity points, you know, there there is the A1 conference, there is SETCs, there are the Midwest auditions that work with Temple and PSU and many other schools uh, to give opportunity for uh, for equity points and and summer work. Um, so no matter where you go, don't let that be a deterrent uh, for you. Uh, the next question I have is from uh, Jessica Levin, uh, who is a rising high school senior. Uh, what makes musical theater training uh, different from other programs? Um, I, it's really just kind of the, the simple, straightforward answer of the specialization of the area of focus. So we have different areas of focus in our department. We have um, production and design, we have theater management, we have theater education, uh, we have acting, then there is just vocal and performance arts, there is just dance arts. So musical theater is really going to um, give you training in the three areas of acting, of singing and musicianship, and of dance and embodied movement practices. Thank you. John, same question. Agree with that. 100%. And um, and so maybe I could actually talk for a second about what makes musical theater sort of different at Penn State. Um, I, I think that one of the one of the things that we love about our musical theater students is that they have powerful and uh, passionate individual viewpoints on the world. And we want to encourage their humanity and their uh, passions and their activism as much as we can inside that journey. And so we have we have two ways that I think kind of at least we like to celebrate as unique to us. One is we have a uh, uh, what we refer to as the Musical Theater Wellness Center. This is kind of modeled after Division one athletics at Penn State has wellness programs that we've uh, that we've borrowed and kind of stolen from from them and actually hired some people away from them, which has been terrific as they, uh, as they kind of got passionate in musical theater. So in that center, we have counselors that are specific to the journey of an artist that are available to our students. We have a nutritionist, we have uh, a medical doctor, we have a physical therapist, we have a vocal health um, SLP and everybody who comes with uh, his team. So we're really excited about the idea that surrounding this education are these initiatives that can help our students instill I hate to just use wellness as a buzz phrase, but instill great um, habits and and thoughts about wellness as they move out into this really, really crazy and difficult profession. And the other is we have an initiative that we call the New Musicals Initiative, where we uh, commission a, uh, a writer or a writing team. They come out to Penn State and they meet our third year students. They get to know them a little bit. And uh, of course our students will sing for them and read for them. But more, just as importantly as that, we dine together and we uh, sit in parks together. And, and the goal is to have the students and the writers get to know each other. What is on the minds of these students these days, these young people, these specific artists who are trying to figure out what they have to say to the world. Mm -hmm. And as that intersects with this writing team and what they want to write about, the writers then go away, write a draft of a musical, and we take the whole senior year and uh, develop that musical with the writing team. Uh, mm -hmm. It culminates in a concert at 54 Below in January and in a, a big reading on campus in April. And if we at Penn State, if we and the writers both have loved that curricular experience, uh, then we'll produce it the next year, and then we'll walk it out into the world and try to co-produce it, uh, like we did with Joe Iconis' piece, Love and Hate Nation, started as a commission here at Penn State, and then we produced it, and then we walked it out in, at Two River Theater last year. So oh. we're, we're hopeful that those things are encouraging our students by, by what we're sort of showing them in their journey, that they are the reasons that any of this happens. Like your particular viewpoint on the world is the reason why you get cast in a show. And then of course you need all your technical skills to come behind it. But those are just two things that we're really proud of these days. I want to, yeah. is it okay? Yeah. I, I, it just really, it, it warmed my heart, John, what you were saying about wellness and not just as a buzz phrase, but I think that is a really important um, piece of how we are approaching the whole person and the person as the instrument and sort of this idea of alignment is not just physical, it's emotional, mental health, it's financial wellness, it's spiritual, it's intellectual alignment with oneself. 
and providing resources and a toolbox, right? So like the musical theater toolbox isn't just singing, dancing, and acting. It's resiliency, it's <laughs> self-belief and narratives, you know, it's overcoming obstacles. There's so much that students have to kind of learn in how you're going to approach the world in a very competitive and challenging industry um, and and really have your have your faculties about you in a way that feels aligned and healthy so um, I'm an I'm an integrative health coach as well uh, just kind of in response to a lot of the rising sort of depression and anxiety I see in our student population so that we can really provide best practices and service even within our training curriculum but also through our wellness center and other kind of outreach opportunities that they have to come and learn about this. I think that's really important. And I love what you guys are doing at Penn State and really respect that too. Thanks. You know, sports had this figured out years ago and mm -hmm. and I, I got to Penn State and looked around and it's such an athletic culture that in this big 10 university that it's really easy to, um, there's a spirit of collaboration at the university that it was really easy to start talking to coaches and say, can we steal some ideas and can we steal your expertise? And the answer was, heck yeah, if it's benefiting young people, let's do it. And so they've, so been, they've been terrific partners. Thank you. Um, this last question is about picking material. Uh, what's How do you pick material? What's right? What don't you want to hear? You know, I feel like so many prospective students get hung up on this. Um. So for us, we want you to pick material. We don't have a do not sing or do list. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, on your part of the continuum and you find yourself in what material you find yourself in. So we'd like you to pick something that's age appropriate, that connects to the essence of who you are, um, that feels like it you can give meaning to it so that you can connect not only on a personal level, but also can really connect to the dramatic material. Mm -hmm. um, we're not necessarily looking for like a huge display of range in terms of dialects or your, your you know, how old you can play. Pick something that's, that's pretty centered around where you are now at this stage in your life, but something that you are excited to share, right? Um, that you're really excited to share with us. And we're also trying to provide uh, some resources um, on our website, this is ongoing right now, to just help you kind of do some search searches for material that kind of fulfills these types of criteria so that we can kind of help with that process. Even sort of guiding you to apps with accompaniment tracks, things like that, and trying to provide those um, on our website to kind of create a more accessible uh, pre-screen development process. Us. But it's really about what you connect with um, and what you want to share and what shows us. I would also say pick something that you can do on any given day in spite of nerves, <laughs> right? So that you're you're really prepared and you feel confident um, about what, what you can bring into the room. And cast us as your cheerleaders, not gatekeepers, right? We're cheering for you. So sweet. Thank you, Maggie. John, same question. Uh, same thing. We also don't publish any do not sing lists or do not do this list because frankly, if you're supposed to get savvy about that kind of stuff, aren't we supposed to help you with that inside your education with us? Right, yeah. So so I guess for us, similarly to what Maggie said, we just want, I want every young person to ask themselves this question before they put material in front of us. What does What do I have to say through this material, me, the young person. And that's such a flummoxing question for some people because we're fully aware, I am totally aware, uh, if somebody would have asked me that at 17 or 18 years old, I would have crumbled because I had no idea what I had to say to the world at age 17 or 18. I'm not positive that I know now. <laughs> um, but I, but I know that that is a filter that they should put their selections through. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, a lot of students are hung up on, let me show you this kick that goes this high. Let me show you this note that goes this high. And let me do a monologue for you that shocks the heck out of you with the language that I'm using or the subject matter. We mm -hmm. don't care about any of that stuff. We just want to meet a young person and understand how they plug into the world right now. Mm -hmm. What do you think about? What do you care about? What are you passionate about? Just ask that question and choose anything you want that feels appropriate to that because we'll we'll figure it out and we'll see right we'll see right into what you're trying to tell us but it's the people that come in and screlt to the heavens that we become very uninterested in not because we're not attracted to that vocal choice but because we can't sort of move through the vocal choice to understand anything about the young person and that's what we want to get excited about the artist the young person 
That's awesome. Thank you both so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to chat with both of you. Now, I know you have some social media handles. If we could just put them right underneath. Will, our engineer, will put it right there. That's for Temple on Instagram. So you can follow uh, Temple's uh, student body and learn more about the program. And there's Penn State's right there. It's P-S-U-M-T. Thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Danny. Pleasure. And thanks, Maggie. Nice to, yeah. nice to be with you. Thank you both as well. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care. You too, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> now please join us on Monday as I sit down with music director of Ain't Too Proud, Kenny Seymour, and on Wednesday, composer Joe Iconis. On Friday, I'm back with college theater auditions with Western Connecticut State University and the Shenandoah Conservatory. For all the latest information on all of our streams, follow us at Playbill and at The Growing Studio. I'm Danny George, signing off.